Millions of frontline workers keep our economy running and are provided with the latest technology to do their jobs. But digital adoption, especially by frontline workers, is really hard. This is Frontline Innovators. We explore how to overcome challenges and achieve success when we empower our essential workers. I'm Justin Lake. And I'm Gene Signorini. Together, we speak with experts who are leading the way and driving digital transformation to the front line. This podcast is sponsored by Skillful on a mission to help frontline workers learn and use the technology needed to succeed in their jobs. Welcome to the Frontline Innovators Podcast. I'm your host, Justin Lake, and I'm super excited for today's episode because we have a very distinguished guest. And his role is a bit different than many of the guests that we've had on the show in the past. And so I'm really excited to explore our normal topics, but from a slightly different angle. Our guest today is the Senior Vice President and Chief People Officer of Sam's Club, which is the membership warehouse club and a division of Walmart. Please welcome to the show, Christopher Shryock. Hello, Christopher. Hey, Justin. Thanks very much for having me and for the uh, for the very warm uh, introduction and welcome. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for joining. I'm really excited about the conversation today. And I, I want to start off with the same question that we ask every one of our guests on the show. And that is, what do you see as the biggest challenge facing the deskless workforce today? Um, so I'm going to cheat on this one and I'm not, I'm not going to pick one thing. I'm going to, I might pick more than one. Um, there's a, a few things that come to mind for that. I think the first and probably the most obvious, um, it really is around fundamentally wages. I mean, you have inflation in the country that's, you know, was, was upwards of 10%, um, double digits in many, uh, different categories that, that people frequently purchase and is kind of sitting at eight today. So wages, the ability to be rewarded um, fairly for the work that they do, and, and being able to kind of uh, kind of afford their afford their lives, I think is a I think is a real challenge. I, I think the second piece is just really, and Sam's is no different. We throw so much at the folks that are that are sitting in in the front line in terms of uh, transformation and digital changes and disruption and supply chain challenges and store resets, et cetera. So just keeping up with all of those business changes, I think is, um, I think can really be quite a challenge for them. Um, and then I think the other piece of the companies can always do better with that, with that specific workforce is just making sure that they feel, um, just making sure that they really feel connected. I think kind of traditional office communication on this, you know, kind of Monday to Friday, nine to five cadence really doesn't work. So um, ensuring that those associates feel connected, uh, feel informed and feel engaged with the company. Um, that's probably the third thing I would say that's a real, um, yeah, that is a challenge for that, for that deskless workforce, um, as you put it, Justin. Yeah. I, I think all those challenges resonate certainly with me. And I think with a lot of our, our listeners as well. And that last piece that you talked about, which is that the, the typical, office communication cadence just doesn't fit with frontline workers. And that's that's exactly why we started the Frontline Innovators podcast to, to really talk about the uniqueness of this workforce. That interestingly, it's not like it's some small niche of the workforce. It actually represents the overwhelming majority of the global workforce. And yet it seems like every time we talk about it, it's it's some exception use case, right? And it's it's really not. It should be at the forefront of our conversation. And so we're we're trying to to raise awareness of that through this podcast. But I know we're we're preaching to the choir with you on that. Yeah. No, I mean it's it's true. And I think it's still comical to me of you have organizations that are, you know, sending frontline folks emails that haven't <laughs> haven't checked an email address in, you know, in, in probably the last uh the, the last 10 months. And to your comment, I mean it's getting the balance of being personalized and sending those comms in kind of digitally sophisticated ways and apps and where they work. But then equally, there's just some old school stuff too of if you got, you know, a meeting with everybody on the floor once a day with the team lead or the club manager, you know, use that as use that as a as a fulcrum and a focal point to make a couple of those um, to make a couple of those pushes for information that you really want to kind of cut through the clutter. So it is really that balance of there's some sophisticated digital stuff and then some old school. Everybody's in a circle. Say the two things they need to know and move on. Ideally, stand up. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly, nice. exactly. <laughs> it makes sense. All right, so I want to really get into everything you've got going on at Sam's Club because you have a lot going on in there. But before we do that, I want to get a little bit of background from you. Tell us a little bit about your journey and how you ended up as the chief people officer at Sam's Club. Yeah, so um, it's, 
if I go all the way back, um, so uh, I, I went to school, all of my, my degrees are all in, uh, in psychology and industrial organizational um, psychology. Um, I started working very uh, for a small boutique consulting firm in, um, in Connecticut. I'd gone to, to grad school on Long Island in, in, in New York um, with a couple of different clients. One of them was a, a large investment bank in the city. Um, and then the other was, um, was, was PepsiCo, which is kind of a fundamental client I had while I was there. Um, I spent about two years after I'd left that consulting firm uh, working for what used to be Sendent Corporation in the, the, the travel port part, which was essentially selling travel content to travel agents and, and direct to consumer, kind of looking after the core people processes for, for that company in terms of succession planning and 360 and performance management, et cetera. And then ended up going back to uh, or going to PepsiCo, who was kind of previously a client and spent um, I'd spent nearly 14 years there kind of in really just in a variety of different global HR leadership roles. So I, during my time there, um, I had the chance to work and uh, worked in New York twice, uh, spent four years in the Middle East uh, in the United Arab Emirates, um, six years in Europe kind of split between um, uh, Moscow in, uh, in, in Russia, briefly in Barcelona, in Geneva, then some jobs in Dallas. And it was always kind of between core people, partner roles, um, talent management jobs was kind of the crux of it, um, with a couple of stints running um, advanced analytics. And then, you know, while it was in Eastern Europe, had some other random stuff like security and health and safety and communications reporting in. Um, and then kind of after the, after the 14 years or so there, the, the timing just kind of felt right. Um, and there was just an incredible opportunity with, um, with Sam. So I've been here for, for almost two years, really just you know, as you said up front, basically looking after all aspects of, of HR here in terms of how we attract, how we develop, how we reward, um, how we retain talent, um, as well as really just how we think about kind of building that that diverse and inclusive organization. So I've been um, I've been pretty fortunate and pretty privileged in terms of um, not only the types of companies, the types of roles, um, but the, the types of places I've been able to work kind of through um, through my career, Justin. That's excellent. Well, thank you for sharing that history with us. It gives uh, just some context for some of the things that we'll probably talk about today. So um, thank you for sharing that. So tell us a little bit about your agenda. You've, you've got a lot on your plate. You've got a massive organization. You've got 600 locations. Uh, I can imagine your role is just completely overwhelming, especially with all that's going on with, you know, the, the dynamic workforce that that's, that we're experiencing today and, and the challenges there. So What's on your agenda for for this year? What are some of your top level priorities that you're focused on today? Yeah, so there's um there's a few things I would say. Um, I think number one really all centers and anchors around this this component in terms of associate experience, which is is really about um, kind of how Sam's, how myself, how my team thinks about this is how you improve, how you simplify, and really just how you democratize people processes and tools. Um, which really just means we're thinking about the experience of our associates that are that are navigating and then just generating benefit from the processes and tools um, and trying to answer questions like, are the processes simple? Are they designed with business needs and outcomes in mind? Are they digital? Can you complete them in as few steps as possible? The folks taking advantage of these are not HR folks. So that associate experience, that's really number one. Um, number two is all around um, talent and capability, which if I kind of, in my simple mind, I mean, that is really about ensuring that we have enough of the right type of talent to execute our business strategy. So um, for Sam's, that business strategy is really um, fundamentally all about thinking about what does our member need being obsessed about the member, which means that we've got to be um, competitive in terms of the quality and the assortment of our items, we've got to make sure we're leading in terms of price. And we believe the competitive differentiator we have is in terms of convenience. So enabling people to shop when they want, how they want, where they want. And we need talent that has the ability to execute against kind of those, those core strategic pillars that we have. And part of my job is making sure that um, understanding if we keep doing the same things in terms of hiring, promoting, and losing people, are we going to wind up where we need to be in terms of having enough of the right types of people to execute that agenda? So kind of talent and capability yeah. is number two. Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, I mean, very similar to almost any other organization. I mean, I think at SAMS, what we've really said is we want SAMS Club to look like the U.S. working population across all levels of our organization, which means 
we've got to identify where we have um, gaps and, and broken rungs. Um, we have a program called um, called SAM7, which is really about these work streams in terms of building awareness, ensuring we have the right hiring practices and protocols, that we are going where high quality, diverse sources of talent are, that we're focused on feedback, sponsorship, et cetera. And I think the key difference for us is those work streams build on each other. So, you know, having the right talent sources, so that doesn't really help you if you don't have the right hiring practices. If you aren't providing that talent with the right feedback and opportunity and giving them exposure to, to progress through the organization. So um, it's really about everything um, working together and integrating diversity into the talent practices we have and, and the way we run the business. It, it's not a separate initiative, but DEI is really important. And, and then finally, I kind of come to this piece of frontline. Um, I mean, we've been kind of on this journey over the, the, the last couple of years of making sure we're hiring the best possible associates for, for the frontline roles that we have in SAMS. Um, and that means for us, we're trying to hire associates that are member obsessed, which again is the fundamental part of our strategy is anchoring on the member. So, you know, looking at work history and work style and seeing how people are in terms of scenarios with members, coworkers, et cetera. And if we're hiring those folks that are member obsessed, we want to make sure we're keeping them on the floor in front of our members. And we want to make sure we're keeping them with the company. Um, and for us, that's really important because we know when our associates interact with our members, our members are a lot happier and their experience with Sam's Club is a lot better. So hiring people that are member obsessed, keeping them on the floor in front of members and keeping them with Sam's, that's kind of the focus for us from a frontline perspective, Justin. So it's really interesting. You actually just connected a couple of things that I, I think are fascinating and, and it makes perfect sense, which is that for a long time, large companies were talking a lot about customer experience. And it seems to me that associate experience, which you let off this, this response to, has really trailed behind solving the problem for customer experience, right? It was like we were so focused on the customers that maybe we at times lost sight of our own associates, yeah, but it's good to hear an organization of your size focus on, you know, the the associate experience as well, and actually connecting the dots to to the point that you know happy employees and satisfied employees and fulfilled employees are able to give the members the experience that they really need as well. And so it really doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. It's not like you focus on the customer or the associates; that it, it allows you to do both at the same time. It's all a big build for us. I mean, I guess what I'd say is a leadership team, uh, probably six, six, seven months ago, we, we spent some time offsite and we were really trying to develop kind of what is that business flywheel for Sam's Club. So to your point, it's true. Everything for us starts with being member obsessed, which then means if you are member obsessed, you're going to have the right quality of items and the right assortment of items. And if you have those things, you're gonna be trying to be selling them at the best possible price. And if you're doing that and creating more business, you're creating more demand. So you've gotta be able to sell it in a convenient way when, where, and how people want it. If you do that, your membership income increases, your revenues increases. And now you've got that money to invest in associates in terms of wages, in terms of resources, in terms of systems, in terms of development, and investing in associates is the step that leads you right back to the top of that flywheel which is member obsession. So to your point, it's not actually possible to be focused on members and not, in my opinion, being focused on associates first and at Sam's Club. I mean, that's exactly how we think about um, running the business here at Sam's. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. How do you, are there techniques that you have found to help your team members, the, the associates develop their member obsession? How do you go about actually, you know, bringing that to fruition if they have the right kind of DNA to do that, but you need to, to teach them some of the skills and, and enable them and, and to really help them understand what member obsessed really means in, in the Sam's culture? How do you guys go about that? Yeah, so I think um, there's a couple of things. Um, there's a couple of things I would say. I want to, even before the development piece, it's really about making sure that we're focused on hiring folks that are member obsessed. Maybe I start there. And yeah. I think there's there's probably a few reasons for this is um, we know that our, um, our member NPS um, increases when we have more member obsessed associates. So member NPS is basically just asking our members how likely are you to recommend Sam's Club to a friend or a family member. We also know that member satisfaction with associates um, increases. 
So it's why that we it's why we run those those assessments in terms of um, making sure that we have um, we have associates that um, have the right skill sets that have the right work style that have the right work history that we see how they are in terms of those scenarios with members because there's a lot of goodness that comes from that so for example you know we've got 600 clubs in sams and for those 200 clubs so the top third that are hiring based on those assessments the folks that are the most member obsessed the nps the member satisfaction in those clubs is substantially higher than our 200 clubs that hire the fewest of those member obsessed associates. And by the way, those associates also stay longer with us, which means for the, for the, the, the second part of your question in terms of development, um, for us, everything becomes about the more experience you have. So the more you drive tenure up, the more you drive turnover down, the better the resources and the tools you give, the better the, the, the better that, that member experience is. So while we spend the time on training, and certainly if you're working at the membership desk or you're a greeter or you're a cashier, or even if you're someone on the merchandising floor that's you know, folding clothes for us, there's some pretty prescriptive things in terms of the training that we would offer in those specific roles. But more to that, there's kind of this cultural element, which basically says, if no matter who you are, if you see a member within 10 feet of you, walk up to that member and how are you? Can I help you find anything today? And if it's yes, walk them to that item that you're looking for. So there absolutely is elements of training that we take seriously, but it's more about that, that culture that I think we've worked really hard to embed. And you see that in terms of who we hire, you see that in terms of who we promote, and I think you see that in terms of what we reward. So for me, it's more of hiring the right folks and embedding that culture, probably even more than it is the technical aspects of what are the development programs we're, we're using for that, if that makes sense, Justin. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. And, and it sounds like you're, you're making a pretty substantial investment in making the lives of those store associates easier at, at every opportunity. So can you share with us some of the things that you're doing to help make sure that they can be in a position and, and empowered to be member obsessed? Yeah. I mean, look, you're, you're right. I think um, making the work easier has been a huge focus for us. I think not only for the people team, but for the, for the business, for the operators, et cetera. And I think we've been on that, this journey of really trying to simplify the work for associates in the clubs for, for several years and, and certainly even before I started with Sam's. And I think for us, everything starts with the work itself. So for example, this is really simple, but if you go back several years, we would we organize the work in our clubs around when traffic was in the club, not around when the work needed to be done. So we changed the way we organize those schedules. Then we work to make those schedules consistent so associates can organize their lives. I mean, there's nothing more frustrating than every week, the days you're working is changing, the hours and the shifts you're working is changing. So kind of this move to block schedules, I think, has been a huge uplift for us in terms of allowing associates to, to be more present at work and being able to organize their lives. Um, I think thirdly, we made, we made sure that associates had access to the right tools. So if that is um, access to the right handheld devices, access to the data they need in terms of where is the inventory in the, in the store? What were the day's um, sales plans and profit and inventory levels? And even do we have these items coming in from the DC? Where do I find avocados? What role is that? Providing these applications that make doing that work really simple so that they're actually focused on those member needs and interaction. They're not focused on, you know, walking the walking the merchandise aisle, trying to see if we have size 32, 34 pants. They know that because it's in their in their handheld. So yeah. once you've got those things, schedules are consistent. Um, it's anchored around the work. The resources are there. Then we really started in, I would say, kind of investing in our associates in terms of um, a few things. One of those was, I mean, honestly, very much comp related. So everyone at Sam's Club um, is at a minimum of $15 an hour. I think our average pay is close to $17.50 and you can earn upwards of $34, $35 an hour now as an hourly Sam's associate. But I think the larger part um, was investing in development of associates, less in terms of how to be member obsessed, but more in terms of giving them the skills that are gonna benefit them in their current roles 
um, and as or more importantly, the skills that they're going to need for future roles. So for example, um, we have this Live Better U program that allows people to get a high school degree, an associate's degree, or a bachelor's degree. We have a manager and training program, which is this experiential program that is getting our team leads ready to be assistant club managers over a period of eight weeks. And we have a pretty, um, a pretty robust program in terms of what does it mean to be a good manager in your current role or in future roles. And I think it's those confluence of give people schedules that are easy and consistent, give them the right tools, invest in their wages, invest in their development. And if you do that, all of that in aggregate really helps to make not only the work better and easier, but it builds on this notion of member obsession. Um, and it kind of creates this culture where people want to be um, and where they want to be working. Yeah. Actually, one of my favorite examples that you just brought up was the scheduling change and, and not necessarily because it's the most profound or complicated or costly change that you've made, actually because of the opposite, because it's probably one of the simpler things to actually implement and it probably didn't cost you a whole lot to do that. But it was just kind of bringing some common sense to say, how can you help give a, a, an improved quality of life to the men and women in your organization? And it's, to me, it sounds like such a simple change, but it has such a profound impact on the workforce. You know, it's so true. I mean, I think in my team, I, I say this a lot of, you know, let's, let's not over HR this, right? And I think, of course, there's elements around, you know, you jump immediately to comp and wages, you jump immediately to, but we're, you know, we're paying for college degrees, et cetera. And all of that's great. And you should do that. But, you know, if you're not doing the simple, basic things well of, give somebody consistency so that they can live their life and give them the resources to be able to do their job well. These other things that we tend to jump to, I think, is people and HR practitioners. Um, it's not that they're wrong. It's just that you have to have kind of the simple foundational things in place um, before you can move to some of those other areas. And the schedules for us was, um, yeah, it, there wasn't there wasn't really any cost to that. It was just, well, this makes sense for us because now we're staffed when the work is, and it's better for our associates. Kind of the uh, kind of the definition of a win win. Um, yeah, we didn't uh, we didn't need six months of detailed design work to get that one right, Justin. Right, and and at the top of the conversation, you said that one of the things that the deskless workforce is challenged with today is that we're throwing so much at them, and we've yeah. interviewed a lot of change management professionals on the show, and they're talking about just the change saturation that the workforce is experiencing both inside their job and outside of their job and maybe especially outside their job but we don't get to live a completely separate life between work and personal right it's all kind of intertwined so if you can take out some of that variability and especially in a situation like you described where there's very little cost and it's actually a positive impact to the organization as well i mean it sounds you know corny but it's a win 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 across the board and, um, you know, it just minimizes. That's one less thing, one less area of change that the workforce needs to deal with. Well, I mean, it's completely true. I think um, if you're able to give people some stability in their home life, if you're able to give people a decent wage and you're able to give people some decent resources to do their job so they're not, you know, for the curbside order, they're not randomly walking the club, hoping they stumble into the right items. And you can simplify those things to the extent possible. Now people are bringing their best selves to work. They're not having to expend energy and effort on things that should be automated for them anyway. And they really can be focused. They really can be present for the members and those people shopping the clubs that we have. Um, and that's kind of even that alignment back to the strategy. So I think there's a lot of those things that, that truly do work in combination. Um, and I think... Um, we are um, and will continue to see the benefits of even those three those three simple things I just talked about. That's great. One of the other things you mentioned before was your increased use of mobile devices. And of course, that's really germane to the conversation that we have on Frontline Innovators. And one of the things that brought us together was some things that I had read about your organization and closing down some of the training centers, or, or if I understand it correctly, it's actually all of the training centers that existed inside your clubs. Yeah, Tell us a little bit about why you made the decision to close them down and how that's going and, and how you're filling the gaps or, or expanding the, the capabilities of the workforce as a result of that. Yeah. I mean, to me, that was this whole component of trying to close training rooms uh, was really this 
it's almost like a parallel step in terms of investing in development. So when, when I started here, um, and really for the two years I've been here, I try to spend a good amount of time out in the markets, out in clubs, out in supply chain sites. And when I was touring these clubs, I just, I had this nagging feeling and this observation that people development just, it wasn't really happening where the work was happening. And I think as a people practitioner and as a function, you've really got to be where associates are doing every other aspect of their job. I mean, learning cannot be something that is just carved off to the side. Um, and if you're asking people to do learning or they're not doing business, I think you're, I think as an HR function, we're kind of just missing the mark. Um, the second thing was, and just super pragmatically, I don't think anybody enjoys sitting in a windowless room looking at a computer that's, you know, from 2010, just clicking through screens because somebody said that they needed to complete it. It's a, it's a really bad experience. And honestly, it's not a learning experience. It's a compliant experience. So for me, in order to, one, just integrate learning with the core work of an associate and to create that better experience, as you said, there was a couple of things we did. We pushed learning content onto devices so that it could be done um, Partly so that the learning could be done in the flow of work, but better said it was so that the recall and the application could be done in the flow of work. Um, the second thing was when it came to some of those core development programs, I had mentioned earlier, this manager and training program of kind of team leads moving to assistant managers. It was really about making sure that that was truly experience-based. So, you know, forget the handheld for that matter. Let's just do this kind of on the floor and, and really see and understand how the different departments work. Um, and I think as a result of this, one, associates can access learning while they're on the floor in front of members. And two, um, they can apply and recall those learnings in, in, in real time. I mean, I, I, I'm not... Uh, I'm not a big believer in the learning and development or any type of training program. This is not a this is not a test you're taking in high school or college where you need to learn it and then you know go take the test. This should be an open book test. Associates should have the information they need when they need it. And then I think the final thing, I mean, you mentioned the training room piece, and we're not through all of that yet. We haven't closed every training room in Sam's Club. Um, but what I would say is one of the things that I wasn't expecting when we did start closing these training rooms is. Club associates started turning those rooms just into great associate spaces they can take pride in. And it's been, you know, as I'm out touring in, in the field, it's really fun to see how each of these clubs, um, they've transformed these rooms differently. Some of them are these, you know, kind of quiet rooms, serenity type rooms. There's other clubs I've seen that have turned them into game rooms with, with an arcade machine. Others have turned them into small libraries. So it's just one more thing when you talk about that cultural element. It's a space that's for the employees that they take pride in that is relevant and resonant for their own club. So certainly wasn't the reason we set out to do it, um, but that that part has been a pretty cool um, ancillary benefit of moving a lot of this content into the flow of work and um, and onto handhelds. You're starting to sound like a tech startup out of Silicon Valley. <laughs> A you very, put very large, on? yeah, 100,000 people. I don't know if that qualifies as small, uh, Justin, but we're doing uh, we're doing our best over here. That's awesome. No, that's that's a really great example. And I'm curious, did you did you or others in the on the leadership team have any reservations about this idea of, I mean, you've probably had those training centers in place for the entire history of the organization. So surely there were some people in the organization that were saying, oh, wait a second, Christopher, that Sounds like a nifty idea, but I'm not sure we're quite ready to make that full leap. What kind of objections did you get? I'll be honest, very few. And I think there were, um, I think there's probably a couple of reasons for that is I think number one, because all of the rest of the work that an associate does, it happens on a handheld, a device they've brought themselves, a handheld we've provided, an iPad, whatever the case may be. So there wasn't really any pushback of, yeah, well, why aren't we doing learning in that same space where associates are doing their work, where they can be applying it, et cetera. That's fantastic. It's not surprising. Um, what technical challenges, if any, did you experience in, in making this shift over to mobile? I mean, I've spent my entire career dealing with mobile technology and I know it never is without a hitch at all. Were there any, any things to overcome or, or did you find that that was a pretty smooth migration since, as you said, everybody was already using mobile devices, you already had the right infrastructure in place and things like that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think without going too far into the weeds, although probably this is the, <laughs> maybe this is the podcast to go into the weeds actually. Um, you know, I think um, there really wasn't a challenge in terms of kind of digital literacy acumen, et cetera, because as you said, I mean, people were already using these devices. So that, that part was pretty straightforward. I think the part was more of the existing library of content that we had. There's a big difference for me in terms of can you access it on a mobile device by, you know, clicking a link on Safari that's going to load a desktop image on your phone? That's not really mobile learning to me. So, of course, there were some elements of how you kind of tie those back ends together to make that experience a good one that we're, we're still working through in some aspects. But a lot of that content is now kind of mobile enabled through the app, but there's more work to do there. Um, and the other big thing I would say is we really tried to start and focus initially on the big bet programs we had. So let's not worry about, you know, the number 22 compliance training that somebody has to do, you know, once every, once every 18 months, let's start with something like the manager quality program we have. And how are we driving that really thinking mobile first as we stop that, which is something that is going to touch every single associate we have on multiple fronts, on multiple points in a year. And the second they move to a new job, that's going to touch them and have an impact again. So it was a bit of that balance of people were, I don't want to say digital natives, but digitally savvy, making sure we were migrating content in a way that was right. And more importantly, and most importantly, really was starting with the biggest kind of most impactful programs and getting that right versus treating every single learning, um, learning course and piece of learning content like it was the same, because it's not. Some of them have way bigger impact than others. And I think starting there was the the, the, the tactic and probably the right one that we took initially. I commend you guys for doing that. I think um, to, to try to boil the ocean all at one time would have probably prevented this innovation from from perhaps ever happening in the first place. So to, to flip it around and really think through the prioritization of what content needs to be modernized and, and how you can build that content out in a mobile first environment. Um, that's a spectacular way to, to get the ball rolling on this change. And, yeah. uh, you know, you'll always, you'll, you'll be creating new content. It never stops as you know, so you can always work to refine that over time, but that's where we, I, we, when we talk with large organizations that seem to be struggling with the innovation, it seems to be that they, they get kind of stuck in this all or nothing mentality. And I really think it's great that you guys just were able to flip that around and just kind of push out the innovation, at least get started with something. That's amazing. And, I, and look, and I think that was the key for us of, this is going to sound cynical and I, and I don't mean it to be at all, but if you're, if you're already having a, I don't want to say bad, a below average experience on some compliance training you have to do on a desktop, well, people are already expecting that to not be great. And they're kind of, they've already adapted to it. They've already accepted it. What I think people can't or won't accept is why would you create something new for me that's going to touch everyone and make that not a great experience? But if you can do that, now you've got the ability to show them, here's what good can look like. Here's what truly um, digital learning and in the flow of work learning can be, and you put your best foot forward, and then you can, you've got plenty of time to go walk backwards and pull that other content in, but you kind of only get one chance to do it the right way. And I just am not a big believer in let's digitize our compliance training or take it from a desktop to a handheld. I mean, yes, sure, you have to do that, but that's not gonna, that's not gonna impress anybody, right? That's not gonna create pull. Um, and, um, and honestly, that's, it's not going to create a lot of ownership, even from the business in terms of trying to push some of these things forward. Makes perfect sense. It really does. And I think what you just described is, is an example that a lot of companies really ought to, to focus on to not get bogged down in the all or nothing approach, yeah. but to start picking off those things that are newer and fresher. And, and like you said, you can always go back and revisit that other content later on. You're going to have a refresh cycle anyway. And the next time you refresh that content, it probably should be built mobile first. Um, but for right now, get the program out and start to get some engagement with, you know, the folks in the field who are really expecting that experience. And so that's oh. a, a great example. Now, no, you mentioned the the manager quality program, but t talk to us a little bit more. What is that program all about? Tell us what that really means inside your organization. Yeah, so, um, so I guess maybe first I would just start with kind of why the, why the, even the, the focus on, on manager quality in the front line. And I think, uh, for me, kind of 
my belief, I think um, the, the people functions belief, and even the, the operators and the business leaders belief is that frontline managers, at least in SAMs, they set the tone for everything um, in terms of associate experience. They enable the culture, they define standards, they deliver the results. Um, you, you walk into a club and I mean that, and I don't mean this in a glib way, but I mean that... <laughs> That club manager may as well be Kath McClay, our CEO. I mean, that that is the person that everyone in that club sees. Um, and making sure not only that those folks are competent managers and leaders, but that they've got individuals under them and that there is kind of that, um, that pipeline and common understanding of what good looks like is, I think is, um, I think is imperative. And I, I kind of feel like my job and the people functions role is to make sure that managers have the skills to be great managers in addition to just being great operators. Um, in terms of kind of what the program is, I mean, six months ago, we, we launched this, this new manager quality program, and it was really anchored around helping associates, almost regardless of level, understand how to identify, how to develop, how to manage, and how to reward talent. Um, and it's really intended for everyone on the front line, from an hourly associate at the, the membership desk or decorating cakes or folding clothes, all the way up to a team lead, an assistant club manager, a club manager, or even a, a, a supply chain site leader in the case of, um, in the case of supply chain. Um, in, in terms of how it works, I mean, I think there's, um, to me, there's a lot of concepts in that identify, develop, manage, reward that, that all associates should know and be able to apply. So I think you know, for example, everyone should understand concepts of continuous improvement. Everyone should understand how to solicit ideas from people that you work with and what a basic development plan looks like. And there are some things that a club manager, that a team lead, that they've really got to be competent in that, honestly, I'm not too worried if the person that's doing the cake decorating or working the membership desk is. So for example, how you truly can become a sponsor, how you really build effective teams. So the content kind of varies a little bit based on the role that you're based on the role that you're in. Um, and I think because that content is kind of bespoke or personalized to specific roles, as associates move up in the organization, and that happens a lot here. I mean, you got 75% of our managers that started as hourly, that content is dynamic. It, it changes with them. So you're still learning how to identify talent um, if you're a team lead that's gonna be different than what you learned when you were an hourly associate. And it's gonna be different if you're an assistant club manager than if you're a team lead. So, you know, maybe, maybe you're, um, uh, maybe now, if you're a team lead, you're understanding how to do interviewing skills versus when you're an hourly associate, identifying was more about understanding what our employer brand is. And then like I talked before, the delivery of that um, is the part I'm probably proudest of. So almost everything in this program is delivered on handheld devices, flow of work, micro and nano learnings. And I think, you know, we're, we're only probably six, seven months into this program, but we've had, you know, more than 10,000 folks that have, that have kind of completed it. The wow. reactions we hear of people like it, <laughs> they're using it. Um, we see kind of knowledge being acquired in terms of post-test as people go through it. Um, and honestly, some of the ROI of we're already seeing an increase, um, an increase in terms of the number of promotions from hourly to salaried associates, less time to fill those assistant um, uh, club manager or club manager roles, et cetera. Um, so I feel like we're, I feel like we've got something here that we can continue um, to leverage. Uh, we can continue to improve and we can continue to sustain hopefully well into the future. Yeah, that's fascinating. One of the things, I, I mean, I've learned so much being the host of this show over the last year, but I think one of the things that's really stood out to me, and it, it seems like it should have been more obvious and it will be obvious to you, but it wasn't to me. And that is just, we had such a focus on the men and women on the front lines, like the the people that I guess you'd say are the first level of the org chart, right? Yeah. Um, that I underestimated the importance of their direct leadership and how much of a role they play in all the transformation. And we're, you know, on this show, we talk a lot about technology transformation initiatives and things like that, but it really involves all transformation and the, the significance of the role that that frontline team leader or supervisor has in the workforce. And you've helped reinforce that. And uh, it, it really makes a lot of sense that you would spend a lot of time thinking about how you develop those skills so that you can build 
a pipeline of people that are going to continue to advance throughout the organization. I mean, look, we have, I think you said it up front, you know, a hundred thousand folks in SAMS, um, disproportionate number of them. I mean, 95,000 plus more, they're in frontline jobs, right? Um, I'm not going to help them <laughs> in corporate. I mean, there's, it's just, it's literally not possible. No matter how many planes you're on, no matter how many places you are, the, re the fact and the reality of the matter is if you don't have good club managers, probably not going to have a good assistant club managers. If you don't have good assistant club managers, you're probably not going to have good team leads. And if you don't have good team leads that are strong managers, the ability to set a clear agenda, the ability to motivate, the ability to inspire, and the ability to deliver results is going to be adversely impacted to a substantial degree. And I just think, yeah. again, it's one of those where, you know, a lot of HR functions, I think, tend to over-index on um, corporate and support functions, et cetera. And I'm not saying that's not important. Again, merchandising is half our strategy. That's really important. But at the end of the day, of if you don't have somebody in that club that doesn't have the right level of standards, if the clubs, if they do not, if they're not neat, if they're not clean, if they're not organized, if the fruit hasn't been culled, I mean, these basic things, yeah, that's management, that's setting tone, that's setting culture. And we can put all the great plans we want that can be very, very smart and strategic. But at the end of the day, somebody's doing something with it in a club. And if you don't have good managers there, th those, I won't say those things won't happen. They are unlikely to happen to the standard and the, to the degree um, in which you want. And that culture is unlikely to be emphasized to the degree that you want. And as a consumer, I'm not interacting with the folks at your headquarters, right? No, I'm interacting that's exactly with the, the men and women on the front lines and your direct line supervisors. So they're the no, one. No, no one, it. there's not a single member we have is taking a survey that says, I was satisfied with Christopher Shryak. They're taking a survey that says, I was satisfied with your associates in the club. I mean, right. full stop. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. All right. We're already running short on time. I am dying to hear about kind of where you're headed in the future. So what's the next evolution of, of the learning experience in, in your clubs? You are definitely an early adopter of embracing mobile technology, which we're thrilled to learn about here. Um, what's next on your agenda to, to advance that further? Yeah. So I have one, <laughs> there's probably a basic thing in my mind we need to get better at. And then there's one, you know, maybe slightly more sophisticated thing. The basic thing, and it's not core learning, but it's very much related, is I continue to think that we and many other companies have an opportunity. If I go back to that associate experience piece, we have an opportunity to provide a better, much more integrated kind of onboarding experience. So I think this is, um, for me at least, this is really an area where um, rethinking the process and the associate experience so that there is a digital platform that guides associates through what to do, what to expect before they start on day one, on day 30, et cetera. I mean, today there is, you know, kind of a minefield of, of, of documents needed to get paid and orientation and learning courses to do and learning the work, et cetera. Um, we can do this in a much better, much more integrated manner. And learning has to be kind of a core fundamental part of that. Um, the second thing for me is, how we integrate learning into a broader ecosystem so that we've got learning content that's that's just more personalized and more relevant for an associate. So instead of having digital learning content, leadership programs, even this Live Better You program, so this free college program, learning's got to be integrated into a broader ecosystem whereby an associate can understand where are they now in terms of whatever, their preferences, their personal attributes and experience, their the credentials they have, et cetera. Um, they can understand and outline where they want to be. So what do they aspire to? And then the organization can have a point of view on how realistic is that, that, that aspiration based on where they are now and the gaps they have in terms of knowledge and experience so that the associate can then understand and receive recommendations for well, what are those learning interventions that can actually help them acquire the knowledge? What are the roles that can help them acquire the experience? 
um, so that they can gain that knowledge and get the experience they're missing um, to go from where they are now to where they realistically want to be. And so I guess what I'm saying really is um, <laughs> I'm not a big believer in this buzzword concept of lifelong learning. Um, I know that's probably heresy because to me, lifelong learning is a means in and of itself doesn't mean anything. I am a big believer in lifelong employability. And I think that learning plays just a crucial and a critical role in that quest. And we can better integrate that into this broader ecosystem. So that's kind of what's on my mind in terms of how we think about it and push this forward and further into the future, Justin. That's that's big. It's it's profound. And you know, I think it you don't think of, or at least I don't think of retail as a, as a place where this is much uh, sophistication is being put into workforce development. And you are, I think, really setting a, an amazing example for how all workforces with a disproportionate number of frontline workers should really be looking at workforce development across uh, across the entire spectrum. And um, so I think it's a, a fantastic example. And I love that you've connected this all to retention and the overall development of those employees and, and ultimately delivering on the best possible member experience that you can provide for your customers. Yeah. I mean, that's it. I mean, if you're not, if as a, uh, as a people in HR or a learning and development practitioner, if you're doing work that isn't fundamentally, um, ultimately driving better workforce outcomes, such as, you know, retention, et cetera. Um, and, isn't then ultimately driving better business outcomes in our case, like member experience, you know, it's probably, uh, it's probably time to reset, to reassess a little bit of what your priorities really are and what value yeah. it is you're, you're creating for the organization. Yeah. Christopher, it's been an absolute honor to have you on Frontline Innovators. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your very busy schedule to, uh, to join us and uh, for sharing your experiences and uh, what you guys have going on at Sam's with, uh, with me and our audience today. So thank you very much for that. Listen, it was a total pleasure, Justin. Thank you. Uh, thank you so very much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Excellent. All right. Well, to our audience, I hope you've enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. And if you have, please help us by sharing the podcast and give us a five-star rating. Um, all of those ratings do help ensure that it gets promoted to other professionals like you that are innovating on the front lines. This podcast is sponsored by Skillful the mobile digital adoption platform for deskless and frontline workers. Visit the website at skyllful.com. And we're always looking for new guests on the show. So if you, Christopher, or you, our audience, know anybody else that's innovating on the front lines, we'd love to hear about it. Uh, make an introduction and we'd love to get them lined up for the show. Christopher, thanks again for your time today. 